like to call to order the November 2nd, 2020 Cabarrus County Board of Commissioners work session. Welcome everyone. It's good to have everyone with us this evening. Uh, first item on our agenda is the approval of the work session agenda. And you all have copies of that before you. Uh, do I hear a motion to approve the agenda as presented or any changes that you might think are appropriate? Move for approval. Okay, we have a motion by Commissioner Hsu and a second by <laughs> Commissioner Kiger to approve the work session agenda as presented. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. Uh, aye. aye. All opposed, no. That motion passes. And <clears throat> we move now for discussion items. Uh, first up, item 3.1 is a lease purchase agreement with the Cons Conservation Fund. And we are happy to have Deputy County Manager Jonathan Marshall to talk with us about that item. Okay, thank you very, thank much. very much. This is an this item, item related to our capital improvement plan, um, the acquisition of property for the Northeast Area Park Project. And we're actually a year behind on this one from when it showed the initial contribution from our CIP to this. But this is one that's fairly unique in that we were showing that initial contribution from that present use value fund that you had set up. So that money is still in that fund and available for this purpose. Um, but to give you some background, um, we had started looking for a, a parcel both for conservation property as well as a future Northeast Park somewhere in the vicinity of Mount Pleasant um, going to the Northeast part of the county. Um, when we did that, we had discussions with Catawba Lands Conservancy about the already preserved Buffalo Creek project or part, Buffalo Creek Creek Preserve south of Mount Pleasant. And we looked at that for both a combination of passive as well as active recreation uses. Um, the active recreation uses in particular did not seem to fit very well on that property, uh, nor did we think that was the best use of that property. Um, and then we also, as we worked through price, began to realize that that was already a preserved parcel. And with what we were paying, we had the opportunity and, and, and chance to proposed to you to preserve some additional land as well as find some additional park land um, in that area. So we began a search in that area and we started by concentrating on natural heritage sites. You had adopted a natural heritage plan along with the Soil and Water Conservation Board that has identified throughout Cabarrus County some unique properties, both in terms of the physical property of physical properties of that land as well as um, plant and animal colonies on the land. So we we use that as a guide. You can actually find that through our GIS where some of those parcels are located. We use that as a guide to find something like the Suther Prairie, that, that it's very unique in, to the county, and these are natural areas that um, really display the county's historic heritage. Um, based on that, we started to focus in on a parcel that had been assembled years ago by the, um, the individual who actually developed the old Park Road Shopping Center in Charlotte and is quite a philanthropist and benefactor to Wake Forest University, Porter Byram. He had put together 615 acres between St. Stephen's Church Road and Lentz Harness Shop Road on off of Highway 49. Um, that has changed hands a couple of times since then and the latest proposal from the owner, which is a group out of Atlanta, was that it be developed into many farms or an equestrian development. Uh, that had, had um, been put on hold and they put the property on the market. So we began to look at it as an opportunity both for conservation property as well as to build a passive park. Um, with that, we put together a group that included our own soil and water staff to look at it, parks and recreation staff, as well as Three Rivers Land Trust, which is the land trust that covers this area, and the Conservation Fund, which is a national group with a large presence in North Carolina. The advantage of the Conservation Fund is they are willing to um, put a property, negotiate a, for the purchase, put a property under contract, 
buy it, and then we would work with them to buy it over a period of time, which allows us both to use our own funds, which are designated for this project, but also allows us to seek grant opportunities to pay for good portions of it. So from the beginning, when they began looking at this, they we felt like the price was was higher than what the market would bear. We had learned that from our own real estate advisors. Um, they had also um, concurred with that. So we entered into a contract with the seller um, based on an appraisal. And I will say to begin with, we're about a million dollars less than the original asking price. So the price for this 615 acres that has been negotiated is closer. It's between five and six thousand dollars an acre, which is um, even in the northeast part of the county, we feel is is, is very much market and the appraisal has borne that out. Um, what they are proposing is to enter into a lease purchase agreement. They would actually part, buy the property. Um, they would hope if, if the commissioners agree to this proposal and I'll, I'll get into the timing of that in just a moment. The commissioners agree they would hope to close fairly quickly, which I think was also very attractive to the seller that they were able to close quickly. Um, we would make an initial contribution based on our CIP, what we had already budgeted for this and proposed that come out of that present use value fund. And then you would also be agreeing to making an additional payment again on schedule with our CIP that would probably come from that conservate that present use value fund also depending on how that fund continues to build um, again this is a very unique piece of property um, you begin to get a, into what are defined as the foothills of the uari mountains you start to see those ridge lines that are indicative of the uari mountains um, the three rivers land trust has already preserved some property that include these upland bogs which are a plant and animal um, unique plant and animal area that you find in the URIs. This site actually contains better examples that they feel than some of the properties they've already preserved. Um, you get a lot of hardwoods on this land. There is some land on, on it under cultivation. Um, we actually, the conservation fund as well as Three Rivers and our own staff feel like that those areas on the property that are being cultivated, that it would be best for that to continue. And we would work to find a farmer and an agreement to, to be able to do just that. But we would leave the wooded areas and, and then there are some parts of the wooded areas that need to be managed because there are some pines on the property. But the hardwoods in particular, the areas we would propose be preserved and that would become the passive park that would be developed in the future for Cabarrus County. Um, again, this is just for a discussion item because I don't have the final agreement and we, we of course need to review that and, and see if there are any changes that need to be made, work out timing, um, but it is to bring it before you to, um, to let you start thinking about this because it is likely that I will have that agreement soon and we would want to put it on your December work agenda and ask you to consider an exception to, to approve it at your December work agenda, at your December work meeting. So. Um, there are attached, there's a memo that summarizes the information I provided that's attached to your agenda. There are maps attached if you need to look at those and certainly be happy to answer any questions you may have about this. Thank you, Jonathan. Does anyone have questions for him? Jonathan, can you, can you, when you say passive park, what does that mean? And what are some of the identified activities that could potentially take place out there? So a passive park is going to be more similar to um, a Camp Spencer, where you would probably have a visitor center or, or nature center, and then trails, um, probably some group camping sites, some primitive camping sites that can be used by organized groups or even individuals. You know, we've looked at, at Rob Wallace Park, the additional property you added to Rob Wallace Park for things like the cabins. So I don't know that we would you'd ever see these proposed for this property, but as with any property that we acquire for a park, we would want to go through a master planning process, get input from citizens and determine what the needs are. But in this case, I think it is going to be very much oriented towards trails, camping, um, the natural areas that are out there you would not see active ball fields, although you might see some open spaces like that that could be just used for, with some shelters and some activities that went around those shelters. Um, 
that, that brings up a good point in that we have not forgotten that we have ball fields off a of North Drive that we have discussed replacing. Um, in fact, Mr. Downs has been working on some, some potential property to replace those, but we felt like as we've gone through this process that the active ball fields that would replace those North Drive fields should be more towards the town of Mount Pleasant where there are other services and where people can take advantage of all the things that Mount Pleasant, the town has to offer. So we've been looking for um, smaller parcels there that we could replace the ball fields on. <clears throat> Jonathan, the problem. Oh, go, go ahead. Go ahead, Diane. Go ahead. Let's say I don't have any questions. I think it sounds like a, a great potential plan and look forward to hearing the remainder of the details. Yeah, I, I was just going to say, Jonathan, that when you talked about trails, you said walking trails, but there is potential for even horseback, horseback riding trails as well. It is a large enough parcel that I think that is very much a possibility. So that, that you know, there's some frontage on 49 that you could use for the, the parking areas you would need for that with trailers and the other support facilities for that. Um, so you could have that on uh, with an access off of 49 and then um, you have both the, the area that's a little bit flatter off of St. Stephen's Church Road, but then you immediately kind of start going up that ridge line into the woods, and I, I think it'd be a really good use for that. I see that, that Londa's on the call. Do, Londa, do you want to make any, any comments or observations about this parcel or whether, I mean, I guess we're planning a passive park, but that's not set in stone, but is that something you see is viable? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And when we went out and looked at it, it is just an amazing piece of property that has all of the amenities that Mr. Marshall was just uh, talking about with the potential for walking trails, equestrian trails, educational centers, and uh, very much education in general, just based on everything that is there from the topography and the plants and the the cultivation, the trees, the whole works. It was a really nice piece of property and fits in great with our master plan for that part of the county. Okay, right. This is the parcel I should have mentioned that we looked at land and water conservation fund as a grant possibility, clean water trust fund. Um, both of those have fairly large awards that are possible. Um, clean water trust fund, because this is a ridge line the far northeastern part of Cabarrus County actually drains directly to the PD River, the Yadkin PD River, and is not part of the Rocky River subbasin. And this is the dividing line between the two basins. So from one side of the ridge, it, it kind of drains to the northeast. On the other side, it drains um, west back towards um, Buffalo Creek. So it, it lends itself to that. There are also some kind of non-traditional areas to look for grant funds on this um, because it has such an um, unique natural areas. I've suggested that we we would approach some of the university partners and I know this is a difficult time for universities to put money into land but but it really does offer some very unique natural areas that, that could be tied in with some study from the universities and there is that Wake Forest University tie because Porter Byram was such a, a very important benefactor to Wake Forest University. Jonathan I just have one question and that is as far as getting it paid for that type thing uh, you're saying that you think that between the present value uh, present use value funds between that and the already allocated CIP funds that will be enough to get us started on this and then you're thinking that the ongoing payments will come from the present use value fund I think so the purchase price is 3.25 million which is actually under the slightly under the appraised value um, the present use value fund, we had identified a million dollars last year to, to go towards this property purchase, and that is available. Um, they are, finance has been working on updating um, some of our information and, and how we get money in, but of course that's, it, it's added to irregularly. Um, it's not something you can expect a certain um, amount of money coming in each year, although we can estimate that because it's, we've had that fund long enough. Right. Um, but that's money that comes in from back taxes as land is leaves the present use value program. And, and you had agreed to set those aside for this purpose to preserve other land. Um, so I think it'd be a million dollars originally, and then we would be do another million dollar um, installment essentially from the CIP 
and I believe that would also could also be covered by the present use value fund. <clears throat> we would have a goal to bridge the rest of that, the 1.25 million um, with grant funds. And again, with our partners at Three Rivers and the Conservation Fund and, and our own staff, we feel like that's very realistic with the funds that are available to, in grants and private donations. Um, so we would want to cover that and then even part of our next payment of that million dollars with grant funds. Yeah, well, that um, very, sounds very great. Because you all of that information there, because uh, I don't, I don't know who all's going to be watching this, you know, but I'm sure the the media will be getting it, our meeting out to the public. But and obviously it's way too early to make any kind of uh, decision as far as how long you think it will be before some dirt would be moved for the Northeast Park. Three, four years, maybe. I think it actually would be longer than that. This is a um, land, even in the far northeastern part of the county, is selling at a rate and, and people um, buying land that, that this is one of these examples where we're buying well in advance before we develop. This is to preserve it really for future generations. I think, you know, when you look at our master plans for Rob Wallace Park, that this would probably be beyond five years before we ever started doing anything. Yeah, that sounds great. Again, that's, that's, why, yeah, that's why it's important that we that part that's in cultivation was being managed for farming that that would continue because that would have activity on the property and eyes on the property and, and a very viable use that we're trying to preserve in that area of the county. Right. Thank you. That's an excellent report, Jonathan. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I, <clears throat> I would just like to say that it sounds like a wonderful opportunity. I think that when we talk about the present use value uh, fund and the fact that that <laughs> revenue comes from property that is being developed in the county that's being removed uh, from from that that designation, uh, this is I can think of no better project where we could replace that. Uh, so it's working exactly the way that it should. It does not come from our general fund. Uh, and then the, the, the grant opportunities that you've discussed, I, I would say, is icing on the cake. So we are, in essence, going to be able to preserve valuable ass assets in Cabarrus County, uh, give recreational opportunities to the taxpayers with, with, without a lot of expense uh, coming from our general fund. So uh, I, I see nothing but, but positives uh, on, on this opportunity. Did anybody else have any other comments or questions they'd like to make before we move on to the next item? Okay, thank you, Jonathan, for thank that you. excellent report. We'll move now to item 3.2, and this is regarding our nonprofit resiliency grant awards. Uh, and we will hear from County Manager Mike Downs and Deputy County Manager Rodney Harris about that item. Okay, hey, Rodney, I'll start and then I'll uh, pass it on to you. Uh, th these are funds that uh, from the CARES money that we have uh, received uh, to to for. Um, safety equipment to replace funds that were expended throughout the county um, in response to the COVID-19. Uh, and we have done just that, uh, just some of the things that some of the monies have been spent on is to help uh, keep shelters going, some personal protective equipment, sanitizer, masks, plexiglass shields throughout the government buildings. Um, uh, personal protective equipment for staff, for the public, and for our nonprofit agencies. We had several mask giveaways and, and other equipment giveaways throughout the year. It helped us deploy uh, computers for our staff uh, to go into the field or to go uh, to leave the office and work from home. And we've expended quite a bit of money there. We've ex we've uh, spent money on the um, on our emergency management, uh, replacing equipment there and, and running the uh, emergency operating center. And a large portion of it is also going towards the Health Alliance in their emergency operating center and all of their testing, their contact tracing and those 
such activities and what we're proposing now and Rodney can explain me and Ellie have been working really hard on this process here is now uh, on your uh, request we've reached we've started reaching out to the nonprofit agencies in the county and how can we help them that would have been impacted uh, as much as if not more than government has so uh, Rodney I'll turn it over to you and you can explain the rest of it yeah, so as the manager said, we reached out to the local nonprofit community uh, on September 28th and opened up an application period uh, where they could apply for these resiliency grants. Um, we received 32 applications uh, by October 12th. And then we had a staff team that reviewed all of those applications and made a recommendation to the manager uh, that we fund all 32 of those applications. Uh, because all 32 were were worthy of support. Uh, they totaled just over $1.1 million. Uh, the nonprofits would be expected to spend those funds between now and the end of April of 2021. The funding for these grants, as, as the manager said, comes indirectly from the coronavirus relief funds that we received from the state of North Carolina. Um, in your packet, you have all of the grants that are recommended. And, and I certainly don't have time to go through each and every one of those, but I did want to highlight at a high level some of the categories that these grants would address. So as you know, the, the pandemic has ne negatively affected our child care programs in Cabarrus County. It's also increased the importance of uh, school aged programs for working parents and created the need for ad additional investments in educational opportunities. And so a total of $306,460 will go to six organizations to maintain and expand educational opportunities for county residents. At the same time, uh, there's been a strain on the physical and mental health of our residents. And so a total of $304,436 will go to 10 organizations in our community that address these health and wellness challenges. Um, the pandemic has increased the need for food assistance, uh, with local food pantries seeing a 40% increase in requests since March. So a total of $283,780 will go to 11 organizations to provide food assistance to county residents. And then finally, the pandemic has led to an estimated 500 local households qualifying for eviction in recent months. And new requests for housing assistance have risen by 52% since March. So a total of $206,900 will go to five organizations to address housing needs and provide assistance with other household expenses. So in closing, on um, behalf of these nonprofits uh, that will receive these needed, this needed financial assistance, we extend our pre appreciation to the board for your vision and direction to make this happen. And we look forward to providing updates in the months ahead about how these funds have helped those in our community during this once in a lifetime pandemic. Excellent report. Thank you, Rodney and Mike. Uh, commissioners, do you have any <clears throat> questions or comments on our resiliency grant awards? Rodney, um, how soon will they receive these funds? Uh, we will start uh, immediately after this meeting contacting them and working on the contractual uh, arrangement with them, and then we will get the funds out as soon as possible. Well, I just want to take an opportunity. I will tell you when I received this email last week or week before last, whenever it came out, made my day uh, to know that we were able to um, possibly take those dollars and, and really directly impact our citizens. Uh, and when you mentioned education, mental assistance, uh, housing, and food, I, I don't think we could be uh, doing any more than that to try to help out during this time. And so it's a, uh, it's a pleasure for me, and I'm so happy to see that you guys were able to do this um, and make this impact. So thank you for helping put us on this track and for all that you did to go through the uh, applications and make sure that we were on the right track. So thank you. Thank you. And I will yeah, say I'd... to that exactly what Diane said. Exactly. I'm just so glad that we're able to do this for the citizens of Barris County. I, it's, it's wonderful we're able to do it. Thank you for working that out, Rodney. Great. Yes, and, and Rodney, whoever you and whoever was in charge of getting the word out to be able to get that many applications in, 
that's a tremendous job because so many times you, you might have the opportunity to help somebody, but if nobody knows about it, they, they don't even know to ask. And so what I was impressed with when you sent uh, the list was the broad cross section of types of organizations and the locations all around the county. It wasn't just one type of group in one certain uh, or specific area. So to me, that would, was the best thing is I, I reviewed that list. So uh, just to dovetail on what Commissioner Honeycutt and, and Commissioner Shu said, just great job and glad we're able to do it. Yeah, one, one thing we were able to assemble several, we, we uh, reached out to several of our employees who had been working on some other committees related to this uh, and asked them, uh, would they be interested in taking on this task as well? Uh, so with Rodney and Ellie, who have been working with the grants all along uh, and reporting back and forth to the state on some of the other CARES money, uh, these other employees, and I apologize, I don't have the list, but I will make sure you have a list of everybody that worked on it tomorrow uh, but they they didn't hesitate. They jumped on it and they did an excellent job of reviewing these requests uh, and, and and working together to make this happen. So well, and I do agree with what Rodney said that it would be great to hear uh, the impact that it made on these yes. organizations. Just it doesn't have to be everybody, but just here and there, anybody that's got a, a, a story to tell on how it made an impact. I think we could all use some good news in this time. And like I say, it was just a, a really pleasure to be a part of a board and the county and staff that could put this together for us. So, I'm not sure what, what I can add to that because I certainly agree with everything that has been said. Um, I think it, it truly, uh, we hear so many conversations today about the number of people that have been impacted by COVID uh, the, 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 the business loss, the, the job loss, the, you know, and on and on. And to be able to do something concrete to assist some of those folks. Um, and certainly, I think it makes a, a very strong statement about Cabarrus County employees, our government employees, uh, who truly do the work that they do because they care about the people of the county. Uh, this is it's not just for a paycheck. Uh, they did not have to, uh, to, to expend the extra effort to serve on this committee and to, to work with these grants. But as, as the county manager mentioned, uh, they had no difficulty filling those positions. And that, that truly tells the citizens how much our Cabarrus County employees care about the citizens and and so that's 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 a testament to to them and and certainly we we appreciate those those efforts uh, sometimes sometimes I think the elected officials get the credit uh, when when it's the people working behind the scenes that truly make things happen and so we very much appreciate those efforts does anybody else have any questions or comments about our resiliency grant awards? I was just going to say, Mr. Chairman, to your last point, um, and, and the manager mentioned the staff team, and I just wanted to call out a few names publicly because uh, they did all of the heavy lifting. Um, so Byron in our Active Living and Parks Department, uh, Karen in Human Services, Calhoun, um, Ellie Landrum, as he mentioned, who leads our grants efforts, uh, Lundy Cummington, Lauren Linker, uh, and Kasha Thompson uh, in communications that did a great job of getting out the information. And then lastly, Kenny Robinson over at the arena. Um, so I did want to publicly acknowledge all of them for their contributions. Thank you for sharing for sharing those names. And uh, they, they're going to make a really positive impact on a lot of lives in Cabarrus County through, through what we're doing. So uh, hopefully we'll have additional opportunities to do to do more. So th thank you all. So if there are no, no additional comments, we'll move now to item 3.3, which is our innovation report. And we're delighted to have Debbie Brannon to bring that to us. Good afternoon. Uh, happy November and welcome to the November innovation report. Um, it should be no surprise to anyone that tomorrow is election day um, and we have a 
service here that um, our citizens can use. They can text CABCO votes to 888-777 to easily access election information. Um, if you haven't voted yet, um, you can find your polling place uh, using the polling place location finder. Um, and then after the polls close tomorrow, you can go to the site for easy access to a, uh, election returns. So after election day, November is uh, a month filled with opportunities to express gratitude. We observe Veterans Day to honor and thank the men and women who have served our country and Thanksgiving to celebrate the many blessings our families have received over the past year. The Employee Digital Book Club uh, for November and the Innovation Report today are focused on expressing gratitude and appreciation in the workplace. In May, we learned from our book, Gratitude Daily, when we express or receive gratitude, our brain releases dopamine and serotonin. The practice of gratitude enhances our mood, it improves our health, and it makes us uh, more efficient, productive, and resilient. In June, we referenced the five languages of appreciation in the book, Sink or Swim, that focused on communication and coming together in a crisis. This month, we are listening to The Vibrant Workplace, Overcoming Obstacles to Building a Culture of Appreciation. And I was happy to hear just now, um, Commissioner Morris and uh, Deputy County Manager um, Harris, you know, expressing gratitude to the employees because that's what our innovation report's about today. It's my hope that listening to this book will help us overcome the obstacles to implementing a new peer-to-peer -peer recognition program designed to build a workplace culture where employees work together to achieve success, feel engaged, and thrive. Because we need employees to achieve, uh, the uh, engaged employees to achieve the county strategic plan. By promoting employees' workplace significance, connection, growth, and contributions, we can cultivate a workplace where employees thrive and connect with the strategic goals and purpose of Cabarrus County government. Today, I am super excited to introduce you to Super Cab Co, a peer-to-peer -peer employee recognition program that offers Cabarrus County staff a way to express appreciation and recognize a peer as a superhero, also known as a Super Cab Co. Here's a short video made by our communications and outreach team in collaboration with the Peer-to-Peer -peer Recognition Committee that explains the program. Let's see if I can get that started for us. So the uh, Cabarrus County Super Cab Co program is a peer-to-peer -peer, um, recognition program that uh, helps em uh, to build employee morale. And so it's a way for us to encourage each other and show appreciation, um, be grateful for our everyday events that we help each other with. We started the program uh, to allow other employees to show their appreciation to each other and to boost employee morale and to celebrate success. Cabarrus County employees are some of the most amazing people I know. They are super CABCOs. And the intention of this program is for us to give them the opportunity to recognize each other and create a workplace that they enjoy um, being in. Um, and there's some amazing outcomes that can come from gratitude, um, showing each other gratitude. Um, there's been a, a survey shown that when you show gratitude to someone, they feel um, empowered and they like to show gratitude to the next person. So it's like a, a, a spark catching fire. So that's what we would really like Super Capco program B is is a, a little spark to catch fire, to uh, generate a workplace that's fun and exciting, a workplace where people uh, create innovation, um, and a workplace that people want to come to every day and, and serve the citizens of Cabarrus County. 
So when you submit a Super Cab Co, you know, obviously the person that you recognize will receive notification via email, but also the direct supervisor will receive that too. Um, so they're notified. Not only that, but the department heads notified when you receive the Super Cab Co, whether it be each tier, Mr. and Mrs. Fantastic, um, Invisible Man or Woman, or a Professor X. Um, and then since your department head has that notification, you'll get recognized maybe at a department head meeting. And then quarterly, you can get recognized at the Board of Commissioners meeting via a certificate, and you can also receive your awesome Super Cab Co pen. Submitting a Super Cab Co is super easy. Go to your application portal and select the Super Cab Co icon. Go to your email if you've received the Super Cab Co and click the link. Go to the Direct Connect and click a link, or just type in supercabco.cabarrascounty.us in your address bar. When the application loads, you can just type in the employee's name from the drop-down box and select your employee that is the Super Cab Co. At that point, you just select one of three superpowers for the employee. How did they really help you? And then there's an additional comments box. Just describe to us how your Super Cab Co really helped you in your day-to-day -day work life. We just want to encourage you all to take a few minutes of your busy day to send out a Super Cab Co recognition email um, to your coworkers. Find something to be grateful uh, for and uh, celebrate each other's achievements. It just takes a few minutes to uh, make someone feel special. That team did a really good job on that. Um, very um, excited about the Super Cab Co program. It was um, created here um, in Cabarrus County uh, without with um, existing resources. And we're using data and dashboards to measure this program's success. Um, as mentioned in the video, there's a number of benefits and desired outcomes that are generated when a workplace has a culture of appreciation. Um, we have increased employee satisfaction and reduced employee turnover. Um, employees that feel like that their uh, colleagues appreciate their work are far more satisfied with their jobs. Um, we can have improved employee relationships and increased transparency because when employees recognize and show appreciation for each other's efforts, that builds trust and rapport. Um, it fosters collaboration um, and improves employee engagement. Encouraging employees to recognize each other's uh, creates a positive atmosphere where teamwork and peer support can thrive. Um, we can improve our customer service because employees that feel appreci appreciated are more likely to uh, provide better care and support for our customers. It also boosts uh, motivation and productivity. Um, feeling recognized can deliver a powerful shot of motivation. Um, when appreciated for work just completed, employees feel highly motivated are, and are more productive the rest of the day. Uh, since the release of our Super Cab Code program in September, there have been 376 peer recognition sent. Uh, remember when we express or receive gratitude, our brain releases that good feeling dopamine and serotonin. So there's been 752 positive employee experiences where employees were encouraged to feel good about their self, their coworkers, their work contributions, and their workplace environment. And to quote, um, William James, the father of American uh, psychology, the deepest principle of human nature is the craving to be appreciated. So to further uh, share our success, um, we're going to uh, further encourage a, cult a culture of uh, appreciation. We are also using dashboards to share the good work uh, Cabarrus County employees are doing with all the employees, not just uh, their supervisors and their department heads. Um, it's my hope that Cabarrus County employees will use the Super Cab Co tool to send authentic and specific recognition to their peers, like the one I've highlighted here, where Altrice recognized Maria as a Ms. Fantastic saying, I appreciate you going above and beyond to get my client the forms they needed today. Thank you. 
um, that this simple act of expressing specific, timely, authentic gratitude took only a few minutes, but it built, built a connection between those two peers and it goes a long way to create a sense of belonging at Cabarrus County. A sense of belonging is the single metric that is consistently uh, tied together with workplace commitment, pride, and motivation. And with that, I'd like to give us uh, public Super C recognition and express my appreciation to the Super CAPCO committee. Lauren Linker for bringing the idea of a peer-to-peer -peer recognition to Cabarrus County and organizing the Super CAPCO committee to Brittany Yoder for making the Super CAPCO app user experience inviting and easy to use, uh, to Matthew Howe for speaking up on behalf of employees who don't work in traditional offices and ensuring that they have access to the program, to Ian Sweeney for uh, coaching and encouraging the committee as we went through the development process, and to Yasmin Milan for her contagious enthusiasm and excitement in promoting the Super CAPCO program. And finally, to Hannah Leitze for, the, uh, for producing the amazing video you saw earlier, sourcing our Super CAPCO graphics and the Super C lapel, lapel pins we're using. This committee exemplifies a workplace culture where peers work together to achieve success, feel engaged, and thrive. As we learned from the five languages of appreciation, uh, one method of employee recognition isn't universally accepted by all employees. This program strives to use all five languages of appreciation to offer an employee the type of encouragement they will appreciate most. I encourage all Cabarrus County employees to listen to this month's employee book club book, The Vibrant Workplace, learn how to appreciate your peers, break down barriers, and make Cabarrus County a vibrant workplace. Thank you. Thank you very much for that report, Debbie. And um, in the, the, the same vein of what we're talking about, you started out your report talking about uh, voting tomorrow here in Cabarrus County. Uh, and certainly that CABCO votes uh, text that, that you mentioned earlier uh, is very helpful. I wanted to, to really give a shout out to, to both our, our, our staff as a whole and most specifically the Board of Elections uh, staff members. Uh, we've just completed a, a lengthy early voting process and talking to a number of voters all across the county. Uh, I have heard nothing but positive comments about the experience that they had at early voting. Uh, the, the facilities have been set up so that people during this time of COVID felt safe uh, and, and the process was easy. Uh, the lines were not long. Uh, but yet, I think we probably broke some records with the number of people that participated in early voting. Um, I spoke with an, an observer for one of the political parties um, earlier today, and, and her comments were <clears throat> that, that she observed just wonderful customer service. Uh, she never heard a poll worker that was not uh, courteous and helpful to the voters and then I've heard the same thing from the voters so so it's really been uh, it makes me feel proud to be in Cabarrus County you know during a time where we we hear some things on on the news where where maybe uh, the voting experience is is not as as smooth but I've heard nothing but but good things here in Cabarrus County so hats off to to all of our board of elections um, uh, not only our appointed members, but our staff members um, for, for making that a great experience for people. I'm sure it will be the just as good uh, tomorrow on election day. And um, based on what I've heard, we're, we're on track to, to break some records with the participation level uh, uh, in our election process. So that's always a good thing. So so thank you for that. And I think the Super CABCO program 
gives us a good indication of why why we see that kind of customer service and and those kind of experiences. Would anybody else like to to comment on our innovation report? Thank you very much. We we appreciate all that you do. Thank you. Uh, so we'll move now to discussion items for action. Uh, and first up is item 4.1 from Active Living and Parks. Uh, we're happy to have May Megan Bumgarner uh, with us to talk about fiscal year 21 matching incentive grants. Megan, welcome. Thank you. Thank you all for allowing me to present our second round for this fiscal year's matching incentive grant program. The Active Living Parks Commission met on October 14th. On that date, we heard a single presentation during the second round of funding for this program. COVID has had a direct and very strong impact on our number of applicants and how much funding people are requesting during this fiscal year. Um, so hopefully we will bounce back next year. But just to remind um, the, the commissioners, uh, we had remaining after you approved the first round of funding, we had remaining for this fiscal year $24,300. The second cycle requested amount, the total amount requested is $16,000. So $8,000 would be through Cabarrus County and the Matching Incentive Grant Program. And the Council on Aging will actually match that and provide the other $8,000. So essentially that would leave um, remaining for this fiscal year if we fully fund the one program during the second round at $16,300. So we would have money remaining for this fiscal year. But the presentation that the ALP Commission heard on October 14th was from the Council on Aging, and it is their outdoor recreation beautification project, which will be focused on the Concord Senior Center. So during a normal year, so we're looking at fiscal year 19, the Concord Senior Center has over 70 programs, classes, and or events offered each week through that center. Um, it's a host site for dances, senior games, Special Olympic events, exercise classes, and this project is meant to enhance the overall aesthetics and hopefully provide a more welcoming and inviting outdoor space um, to the community. They have already sort of expanded the recreation areas outdoors. So now this particular project will focus on renovating the landscaping, not only around those outdoor recreation areas, but the senior center as a whole. It's also going to increase biodiversity through enhanced habitats with native species. Um, so we actually looked at the design. It's very exciting. They are putting in drip irrigation, so it will be cost effective and we will not have to have massive watering anymore. And they are also focusing on native species. So they will be utilizing plants that are native to North Carolina throughout the landscaping. Um, as I stated, the total project cost is 16,000. The application was complete and intact, and it is a level two moderate priority. Um, but as we said, this is our only applicant for this second round of funding. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Byron Hagler is also on and is very um, intimately aware of this application and this program process. Um, so we'll be happy to answer any questions, but I would request a motion to approve um, this project so we can get the Senior Center hopefully um, extremely beautiful for the next fiscal year when the doors will be wide open and the community can come back in force. Great. <clears throat> Thank you, Megan. I failed to mention Megan chairs our Active Living in Parks uh, Commission, is one of the volunteers there. So we certainly appreciate what you do in that entire uh, commission. Uh, spends a lot of time uh, looking at these projects. And I'm glad we have some graphics on the screen now showing uh, what that beautification project will look like. The commissioners, do you have questions or comments regarding the, um, uh, the incentive grant? 
Okay, hearing none, uh, that will go on our uh, agenda for our regular meeting in two weeks. Uh, so we uh, look, look forward to, to seeing that project go forward. Uh, next up is item 4.2, which is appointments to boards and committees. And you all have um, a complete list in your agenda of, of those. Uh, they were sent to you in advance as well. Uh, so if are there any, any comments or questions uh, regarding our appointments to boards and committees? Okay, hearing hearing none, I will will mention that 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 uh, is a, a very important piece of what we do. And just as I mentioned, our active living and parks commission uh, earlier, we have many many boards uh, with a lot of very dedicated volunteers that that fill those positions uh, and and bring those items to the board. So so if anyone is interested in serving on a board or commission. Uh, there is a list that is maintained on our website. Uh, certainly they can call our uh, our county clerk to the board's um, office as well if they need additional information. So we will move now to item 4.3. Uh, this is regarding uh, modifications to the central area uh, interlocal agreement and we are delighted to have Jonathan Marshall back to talk about that. This is um, th this is related to the limitations on utilities in certain areas covered by the central area plan, uh, a jointly adopted area plan, long range land use plan that we have with the city of Concord. This is another case where Concord has water lines that are available to these two parcels of land. Um, and the owner is asking for a modification to our agreement to allow him to connect to those water lines. I will tell you, it does not result in more growth. They, they probably could have put wells in, but these are also existing lots and they have the right to build on them. So I, we would recommend it to you. I believe the city of Concord is also considering it and is considering it favorably. Um, we'll probably have another one next month. So I will be back talking to Mr. Cook about a way that we can do this administratively rather than bringing them to the commission unless you would like to keep hearing them. But typically these are ones where these are just very minor exceptions where that public water service is already available and just allows someone to connect onto it. It does not allow large scale growth in these areas. Jonathan, looking at that map, is that just two, two lots that we're talking about? It is just two lots on Westview Road, which is out off NC 73 near Cold Springs Road, as you can see. Um, actually, this was an older subdivision like you would see many years ago where there were a number of smaller 25 foot lots. So this this isn't really even a, it's not even a subdivision at this point. It's a recombination map, which is a, a legal exception. So again, you, as you can see there's just been some development in the area and they're all served by septic tanks. There is no public sewer there. And this just allows them instead of having a well to connect to public water instead. Right. Any questions for Jonathan? Okay, thank you very much. We move now to item 4.4. Uh, Cabarrus County Schools Student Device Lease Agreement. Um, and I think we have uh, Superintendent Chris Lauder uh, and Finance Director Kelly Klutz uh, to talk with us about that along with our Cabarrus County staff. Uh, uh, Manager Downs, did you want to start that off or hear from the school system first? Uh, yeah, Dr. Lauder is going to introduce it and then hand it off to Kelly and then Rodney and I can make comments afterwards. Right. Thank you. Yeah, it's great. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, as many of you know, in March, we kind of had a major shift in, in how we work with the school system. Our, our, our laptops pretty much were done in a cart system. So what happened is kids came in each day and kind of used the cart in the back of the room. We did not give um, computers for all of our students to take home. So Beginning in March, and certainly when we began this school year, we had to switch that out and kind of go to a new model where we handed computers to all of our students. So we've given out over 30,000 computers um, this year for students to be able to take home. And over the past 
uh, really three or four years, Mr. Downs and Ms. Dubois and Ms. Klutz and, and now Mr. Harris and I have all kind of tried to work on a funding source for computers um, because pretty much the model that we've used now is when we've opened up a new school, for example, then there'll be an influx of funding for that. But four years later, when those devices are, are worn out, we don't necessarily have a funding source. So what we've worked with the county staff with is to try to get recurring money. So every four years, all of our devices would be on a lease. So they would, in essence, be, be funded without these big influxes of money um, and then years when there wasn't an influx of money. And so, um, again, with that pretty much um, put before us, it does not look like we're going to go back from that, meaning um, don't know exactly how long COVID is going to last. But even when it does, I think we're still going to be giving out devices. It's just kind of the whole model has changed whether we wanted it to or not. So what we were um, proposing is kind of the last influx of recurring money to be able to be used. So this year, if we would put up the the front part of that, but basically a million dollars of the lease for four years, then build that into the budget for next year, meaning 21-22, to pick up and continue funding that. So then we would, in essence, have all of our devices funded and replacement for that. Um, and so when we enter into a lease, um, then obviously that's a four-year term. So we have to bring that to you guys to make, make sure you're good with that. We've obviously discussed that with Mr. Downs and Mr. Harris, and want to make everybody aware of that. And Ms. Klutz, do you have anything to add to that um, specifically about money? No, um, the current year um, we'll be able to pay that through our fund balance and accumulation of you know funds that we've received from different sources for COVID. So this fiscal year doesn't present a problem. Um, it's the future years um, that we're certainly asking for your help, and then. We, there's there's a, a general statute that requires if we obligate for four years that we need to get commissioner's approval to do that. Thank you. Mis Mr. Downs or Mr. Harris, did you want to add to that? Well, as Dr. Lauder said, we, are, we have been trying over the last several years to come up with ways for recurring money uh, when we can afford it to to uh, meet those deferred maintenance issues at all different levels of pricing. And this just is another option or another uh, opportunity for us to to establish a recurring uh, fund or recurring funds uh, to meet the needs of the schools when we can afford it. And uh, so Rodney's going to talk to that about the affordability and, and, and your commitment if we do uh, approve it. Yeah, just from a process standpoint, if this item is approved, we would budget the additional million dollars starting in FY22, so starting July 1st, uh, and then that would be budgeted each year for the next four years um, or, or longer if the lease is renewed. Um, so in general, the board would still maintain your authority to either increase or decrease the Cabarrus County Schools allocation on an annual basis, as you do now. Um, so with this commitment, they would have a million dollars earmarked for this purpose. So the Board of Education would have, have to find cuts elsewhere if you felt the need or had the need to reduce their budget in future years. Uh, but we would put the million dollars there for the next four years for this purpose. Okay, <clears throat> commissioners, do you have questions for any of the presenters? I've got a quick question and, and the, Getting a plan in place is 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 good. I know it, it's been a long time coming, and you guys have worked on this a while. In the lifespan of these devices, four years is a long, long time. I mean, they they these things. It doesn't take long for you to have something that's that's out of whack. So, does the leasing, you know, when they're renewed, can you swap devices out during that period, or is it are you stuck with that device? for four years and then you turn it in. Um, am I confusing the lease period with the actual devices? Does that make sense? Can you swap devices during the period? No. Okay. So we're, we're pretty much and feel pretty confident. I mean, you're right that there, there's certainly times when they don't go, but right now, if we have all the devices on a four year lease, we're pretty confident they get through. There's obviously a warranty. If something has a problem, then we can trade them out and we have some extra ones to trade out. 
But um, when you put them on a five-year lease, we get a little more scared. That's why we've been trying to get them to four years. Um, but right now, four years, we're pretty confident we're in good shape if we can get them on a four-year lease. Okay. Does that include and that's school individual schools, but uh, uh, does that include, I mean, is that system-wide for people that aren't tied to a specific school, like in the EC department or over at the bus garage or uh, you guys there at the admin center, that, that's everybody. Yeah, and a teacher device is sometimes is a different device, so sometimes those are more, um, but yes, pretty much it's the technology needs that are out in the school. And what, what we have now is when we open up a new school, you may buy, you know, 1,500 devices because that new school is open, but what we would be doing in the future is just saying, hey, if we have 300 new students, then all we have to add to that is 300 devices, and then we'll pull from other places. So it's a much more efficient way to do it. And again, then there's perpetual funding instead of kind of big influxes and outfluxes, if that makes sense. Yes, it does. But it, it does include devices that are not tied to a specific school. Yes. Well, yes. Go ahead. The, the plan in general to get to a four-year reoccurring lease includes all of the devices in the system, whether that is teacher devices, student devices, um, you know, guys, uh, gentlemen that work in our facilities department or our bus garage, all of that is included in the plan. This particular lease that I want to do in December is is 100% targeted to students because that's our highest need right now. But the plan um, involves all of our devices. Right. The four-year plan. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments? Well, this is Liz. I'll just make a comment. Um, a number of years ago, we moved funds so that it, they were designated for technology. And that was very important when we did that, so that the school system knew the funds that they had available, and those funds increased over time which I think was a really good thing that the county has done. Um, likewise, this is uh, this would be critical for going forward. I mean, this shows a true support of public education and the needs of our students right now. And uh, the school system staff are 100% correct. That's not going to change. Uh, COVID may get under control, but there will still be students who, um, who will need that and uh, providing these devices, providing, uh, if you all will remember when we talked about our goals with the North Carolina Association of County Commissioners, I mentioned that broadband was a very important goal that we needed to support. Um, we have areas of our county that, do, that does suffer from lack of Wi-Fi. Uh, the school district has done an excellent job of reaching out and helping teachers and helping students to work with that issue. Um, they've also worked with how to make sure um, the computers and the Chromebooks that they're buying are compatible and able to be used uh, for uh, live streaming and for connecting. Uh, there's some softwares on the high school level that are very expensive and unique, and uh, there's a program they've got that helps students to be able to, to um, remote in and use, use that software. So uh, commendations to the school staff for turning on a dime or maybe turning on a penny. I don't know which way you want to call it, but reacting so quickly and making this something that can be done. Um, there are reasons why students have to come on campus, but uh, I don't know the exact numbers of how many students are staying virtual right now um, because families are still concerned. Uh, but this technology is extremely important, and I'm glad that you guys have brought this to the county's attention to help make sure that uh, the technology is available to students. So thank you to county school staff for doing that. And um, I'm sure the commissioners will all support it because it just makes sense to move forward. So thank you. Thank you, Liz. Um, other questions or comments? Well, I think as, as has been pointed out, it certainly is an important issue. Um, you know, we talk about how rapidly, I know I experienced that myself personally, uh, when some new opportunity comes along and I want to try to do it with a device that I have, 
And the answer that comes back to me is, well, this, this is a little bit old. Uh, my response is always, well, I just bought it. And, uh, but then when I look, it might be three or four years ago and, and it does move rapidly. So I'm, I'm proud that we are headed in the right direction. And the things that we've done over the past years, as Commissioner Poole pointed out, um, have, have helped and, and we're continuing to, uh, to move in that direction. So it certainly is, is, is something that I think that probably, truth be known, uh, Cabarrus County, uh, hopefully, was in a little better position um, uh, when we went into the, the COVID situation and the remote learning than, than some of our counterparts in other parts of the state. Uh, so we, we want to retain that edge as well. Uh, any other comments or questions before we move on? All right, thank you all very much. And thank we you. move now to item 4.5, uh, parking agreement with the city of Concord. And Jonathan Marshall is back with us to talk about that one. This is a continuation of the economic development agreement you had approved with the city of Concord. As you recall, in the information we presented, there was a need to um, overall to meet the parking needs for that project long term. Um, the solution has been put together by the developers who will be constructing spaces with those projects as well as the city of Concord, which has spaces that they have downtown, including um, that they had reserved in our parking deck by contributing to the construction of that deck, as well as some county spaces. Um, the agreement is actually based on a, a time in the future when we charge for those spaces, when we start to um, use the gates and charge for the spaces primarily during the day. So it foresees that happening at some point, although we don't know when that will occur. I wanted to point out a couple of things. Um, we do have a meeting tomorrow. Mr. Cook, Mr. Billifer and I are meeting with city staff to work out some comments that Mr. Billifer in particular had on the agreement. And so we're continuing to tweak it. So we will update this and, and put the revised agreement in with your agenda. Um, and then in addition, Mr. Shu or Commissioner Shu had pointed out or asked that um, when we reach that point that these spaces are being leased, that it not be the the individuals coming to the county or city to lease the spaces, that they have to go through the development company or through the management managers of those complexes. So this agreement is set up in that way. So we will not be the ones having to deal with individuals and do the collection. It's set up so they'll deal with their management group, who in turn will be obligated to pay that monthly rent to the county or city, whichever is applicable. So again, this is in keeping with the discussions we've had throughout this project. It should be the final agreement you have to consider, although there, there may be one about a party wall where the um, building is being constructed next to the parking deck. We may need to work out um, if any of that construction actually extends into our deck and what materials that is and that kind of thing, which would be a minor agreement we may have to bring back to you. But this is the last major agreement in this overall project. Thank you, Jonathan. Questions for Jonathan on this item? Well, I've, I've had the, the opportunity to, to, to be involved in a couple of those discussions, and it is a very complicated and complex um, set of events to work out all those details. Um, and so compliments uh, to, to all those that have worked on that. This is I think a, a, a great example of a, a collaborative effort that began. Uh, the county needed the parking deck for our courthouse customers and, and certainly the expansion that's currently taking place. Um, the city of Concord participated with us on that uh, to meet some of their needs downtown. And I don't think at the time that we did this, we had some general ideas of some future development that, that might occur, but I think what we're talking about here has far exceeded what we might have visualized at that time. So I think it's a good example of some of the positive things that can happen when we work together um, as, a, as a group. So that being said, we'll move now to item 4.6. Uh, we are happy to have Bob Bushy from our Cabarrus County Transportation Department with us. And I think he has the next three items on our agenda. 
So we'll start with uh, the 5307 grant. Uh, welcome, Bob. We're glad to have you with us tonight. Uh, thank you very much, commissioners, for letting me present to you tonight. Uh, we are applying for a federal 5307 large urban grant to replace all of the radios in our buses as well as our dispatch office. Our current radios have met their useful life and we have been informed that uh, there will no longer be replacement parts. So if a radio breaks, it, it is of no, no use anymore. So we are applying, we have a quote for $42,074.50 to replace all the radios. We're applying for this grant, which would be a 50% match. So if we are approved for the grant, uh, the county match would be half of that. And uh, it does require a public hearing. Very good questions for Mr. Bushy on, on this uh, grant application. Okay, if you would like to move to item 4.8, uh, fiscal year 22, uh, community transportation capital grant. Okay, these two next two grants are our annual 5311 grants, and, and I've got to uh, bring you up to speed on a few things. We've been having bi weekly meetings with the state of North Carolina. This year, most of that conversation, of course, is, has been on the COVID. However, they did notify us early on that the uh, because of funding, they would no longer be able to participate in the match of our grants. So the county match on these are going to be higher. They also told us in September we had been waiting on the uh, contract for this year's 5311 that went into effect July. They told us there was no money and these grants would not be funded. A week later, I received notification that they found the money and we signed the contracts last week for this year. However, they have made it clear there's no guarantee that the funding will be there next year. So I am presenting to you a 5311 admin grant in the amount of $173,684 in the hopes that if accepted that the state will be able to provide the funding. That also requires a public hearing. With that comes our capital grant and I had provided two options for you before they told us that we would get this year's funding uh, for 16 vehicles or 10 vehicles. Now that the funding is back, we will be purchasing six vehicles this year, so there's not a need for the whole group in 22. So the option then would be uh, the second option of 10 vehicles or less if you would like to do less. And both of these grants, the capital and the admin, will require public hearings. Very good. So questions for Mr. Bushy on either any of these three items. I think okay. these are all ones that we have probably talked about in previous years. I'm sorry I interrupted somebody there. Sorry, this is Liz. I just have a couple questions. So you're recommending 10 vehicles? They have dropped the, the mileage requirement for replacement from 145,000 to 100,000. <clears> so we have 16 vehicles that meet that requirement. Now that we are going to get the grant this year that we came to you last year for, we will replace six of them. That's already been approved by the state, which means we will have 10 in 22 that are eligible for replacement. So you could choose to replace those 10 or a lesser number if you would like. Okay, but you're, you're asking for to replace the 10. We have, yes, we have 10 that have met the mileage. Okay. And then this would be more for Rodney probably or uh, the county manager because you mentioned that the funds may or may not be available at some point in the future. And so on the administrative grant, if the funds are not available in the future, where will the funds come from? Uh, it would then fall completely on the county. Yeah, so that that's right. There would be then it would have to be a funded program by the county, and then there would have to be discussions whether the county wants to continue that program by providing that additional funding or to discontinue the program. 
Okay, thank you. That's what I thought I heard. I just want to make sure that that is, that's what's going on. I mean, obviously NCDOT, um, people are not traveling as much. They don't have as much money coming in. A lot of projects have been delayed. Um, construction project and everything else that NCDOT is funding. Um, it's not their fault. It's not our fault. It's just the fact of, of the nature of people aren't traveling as much and they just don't have as many funds coming in. And um, construction costs have gone up lately. So um, I'm thankful for everything that NCDOT has done for us in Cabarrus County and hopefully things will turn around and there won't be a question in the future about those funds being available. But I, I presume uh, County Manager Downs that that was gonna be your response. So thank you. Thanks. And we have received three care grants this year that have helped tremendously. Yes. Great. Okay. Any additional questions on these three items, uh, commissioners? Okay. We will schedule the public, those three public hearings uh, for our next meeting, and that, that will be included on our agenda. Uh, that we will uh, discuss at the end of this meeting. So we move now to item 4.9, Powers Great American Midways Renewal Agreement, and we are happy to have Kate Sharp with us to discuss that item. Good evening. It's time to renew our partnership that we have with Powers Great American Midways, which is the company that provides all the professional rides and games at our annual county fair. Powers has been with us since 2006. They are the, if not the absolute highest rated and respected carnival companies in the industry. Um, in the renewal, you'll see our agreement with Powers would now go through the 2026 Cabarrus County Fair. We will continue to open the Friday after Labor Day each year. Historically, when we renew this agreement, we take the current agreement and add five years to it. Our current agreement that's in place only goes through next year's fair. Um, in the past, we have renewed it a little bit sooner than we did. There, there's some different changes that they made. We made uh, some pricing changes two years ago. We wanted to see how that played out and that everything looked good, that we didn't want to make any other significant changes to the current agreement. Um, between our prime September dates and the number of other events that seek to partner with Powers, it's imperative that we contract five years out to ensure that we're locked in. There is definitely significantly more demand than actual supply for carnival companies out there. And we don't wanna find ourselves without or without a legitimate company. So this also helps protect us from that. Um, as many of you have seen, Powers puts an exceptional focus on safety and cleanliness. Um, they've been recognized nationally for that by the Outdoor Amusement Business Association but they also take a lot of pride in working in our community and they have a really great relationship with all of our staff and volunteers. So I really believe that we're better prepared for successful longevity in part because of how proactive Powers has proven to be with ever evolving industry practices. And now with the coronavirus and the steps they are taking to enact numerous new and improved safety measures for not just next fall, but beyond. Um, and with that, Powers wanted me to pass along their sincere appreciation for your ongoing support of the fair and their um, absolute enthusiasm to continue working with us. So with that, if you have any questions regarding this renewal, I'd be happy to answer them. Okay, this is Lynn Shu. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, well, you know, we canceled this year's fair, obviously, for the COVID-19 situation that we're all in. And the thought came to me during that process time, because it's the first time we've ever had a fair canceled since it started. But when we sign contracts such as with powers, do, does that obligate the county in any way if for whatever reason the fair is canceled, other than the contract just goes on, oh, well, we missed the year? Is there, yes, any, sir. Monetary, is there any monetary value that comes from the county, even though we didn't have a fair. You understand what I'm saying? Yes, sir, I understand. 
Um, when we make a decision to cancel, like we did this year with um, plenty of time in advance, there with power specifically, no, there's no monetary. At any time, we have several clauses in there we could cancel. They're the ones who pay us. We don't pay them. So for this specific contract, but speaking overall with all of our fair contracts, we do have phrasing in all of them where unless people have arrived and we are in the midst of setting up the fair, um, there is only the monetary funding that we have purchased, such as supplies that have to be purchased throughout the year because we just can't wait till the last possible minute, which you heard a little bit about when we were trying to make that very difficult decision to cancel the fair. There are some funds, you know, such as staffing year round and things like that, but it is minimal in comparison to the overall cost of operating the fair. Very good. Thank you, Kate. Okay, any other questions for Kate on this item? I will say that uh, Commissioner of Labor uh, typically has visited with us prior to the fair along with, uh, with their inspectors and uh, we have won a number of awards uh, for safety and the setup of those uh, rides and they always have very complimentary things to say. Uh, so I think that that's due to, to both Kate and her staff, as well as Powers and the way that they uh, set up the uh, rides and attractions. But thank you very much. Uh, we will move now to item 4.10, uh, update of County Capital Projects Fund for Frank List Park Barn and Silo. Uh, we're happy to have Kyle Billifer and, uh, excuse me, Susan Farrington uh, with us to discuss that item. Good evening. Um, with, the, with the fire at the Franklin's Park, the barn and silo, we were able to obtain some uh, insurance proceeds and we came to you earlier in the year with some different proceeds and we received our last um, receipt of the funds uh, just recently. So the total, there's a um, caption of all the revenues and, and budgeted expenditures so far in your agenda package. But so far, um, excuse me, in total, we received $1,079,632. So in previous budget amendments and meetings, April 13th, and then again on um, July 21st, we were able to allocate $145,208. And what we would like to do is move that over to our capital projects fund so we'll be ready to spend those funds when you, we get ready to replace the barn and the uh, with the overall plan. So at this time, the balance that we need to transfer from our insurance fund into the capital projects fund is $934,424. And that is a budget amendment is also included in your agenda package and that $934,424 will be allocated for another $300,000 for the architect for planning purposes and then the balance will be placed into the construction fund awaiting for the future plans for the replacement of $634,424. So in your <coughs> package, there's a, re a recap of all the insurance proceeds received so far. Um, to date, a million seventy-nine thousand six hundred thirty-two, and then a budget amendment, and then of course a project ordinance to go along with this movement of funds into the multi-year fund, the County Capital Projects Fund. Is there any questions? Okay, I, I think we have have discussed this a, a couple of times. Uh, so thank you for that report. Uh, any other questions? Okay, hearing none, we'll move to item 4.11, uh, offer for purchase of surplus property. Uh, and Kyle Billifer will talk with us about that. Yes, thank you, sir. Um, during the last meeting, it was brought up in front of the, the board. We did have an offer for $1,500 for pin number 56410019790000. It did go through the upset bid process and there were no upset bids. Um, so the board can either just put this on the consent agenda for the next meeting, or if you want, you can vote now to allow me to move forward with the county attorney to process the deed and make the sale of the property final once we receive payment. 
Thank you. Any questions for Mr. Billifer? I have one. I noticed that you have the requested action is to go ahead and um, make that conditionally acceptable. Are you talking about you want us to suspend the rules tonight or just put yeah. that on the consent agenda? If you choose to, you can. In the past, we have, we have not suspended the rules. We have just gone through with the, with the actual regular meeting. I just always leave it as an option for the board. Yeah, I'm, I'm fine with the consent agenda myself. Any other questions? Um, and, and so I, I would be in favor of leaving it on the consent agenda unless there is a compelling reason uh, if Mr. McCormick has something pending that uh, that it would be helpful for us to take action now, is that or is there anything, Mr. Billifer? No, the way I explained it to him was that it would go through the regular meeting and, and I explained this to everybody who requests anything, whether it be the vehicle or property, is that it's a two month long process from the time we, we put it in there. Right. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, hearing none, we'll move to item 4.12 from Planning and Development Department, uh, Planning and Zoning Fee Schedule Update. And we are happy to have Susie Morris with us to explain that. Good evening. Um, the item that you have before you is a request to update the Planning and Zoning Fee Schedule. Um, as you may recall, um, no changes were proposed to this particular fee when the overall study happened um, and the new fee schedule was adopted. Um, since that time, the Health Alliance has been able to update their fees. Um, we have also, um, you know, kind of tracked what's happening with our part of the Health Alliance's um, process. And staff is requesting that the Board of Commissioners consider to increase the fee to a minimum of 20% of the cost recovery, which would be $80, with the recommended fee being $100. Um, and that's approximately 25% of the cost recovery. Um, along with that, there are two additional fees that staff is requesting be established. Um, with the adoption of 160D, which is the legislation that combined planning and zoning uh, regulations for counties and cities together. Um, there is a health temporary health care structure that was added, and there is also a renewal fee that is a possibility for jur jurisdictions to assess. So what we are proposing is that we would add a temporary health care structure permit fee of $75 and then add a temporary renewal fee of $25. Those are both within what the statutory regulations allow. Um, and we would ask that the board consider adding all three of those to our adopted fee schedule with that being effective uh, December 1st of this year. And I'd be happy to answer any questions related to any of those proposed changes. Okay, questions for Susie. Susie, can you give an example of a temporary health care structure? So what that is intended to be is it is a smaller portable structure. Um, so you can think of it in terms of maybe a, a smaller construction trailer, um, 300 square feet that someone could move onto the property. Um, then it would be there for the duration. So it's intended for someone to take care of, say, an elderly parent or maybe someone that has had some health issues and needs some additional help as a family member. Um, once that unit is no longer needed, then the statute says that it would be removed from the property. So similar to an accessory dwelling unit, but a little bit different in that it does not necessarily have to be on a permanent foundation based on, and that is a, a statutory regulation. Thank you. So if I interpret correctly, what, what we're doing really makes it easier for somebody that has extenuating circumstances uh, where it's allowable for them to do this less expensively 
than than if they were just going to do it for a different reason. Is that correct? That's correct. Um, this particular statute um, was adopted to try to assist uh, people that may be experiencing this type of difficulty with their families without having to go through everything that would come along with a full fledged accessory dwelling unit. Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> any other questions on any of these items for Ms. Morris? Okay, we thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, we move now to item 4.13. Uh, from the Register of Deeds Office, ref refund of excise tax, uh, and the county attorney, Rich Cook, will address that one for us. Excuse me. Um, I wasn't sure I was going to be the one to address this one, but we have these come up from time to time. And this is where um, someone paid uh, uh, revenue stamps or excise tax in Cabarrus County for some property that was actually in a different county. It is filed in the wrong place. So basically, in that situation, they're entitled to get a refund and they had to file the, the deed in the proper place. So it's all been taken care of that way. So we're just talking about refunding what they paid in Cabarrus County by mistake. Right. Any questions for Mr. Cook? All right, thank you, sir. And we have run into this periodically. Mm -hmm. um, okay, that, that completes our discussion items for action. Uh, we move now to the approval of our regular meeting agenda. And you all have a copy of that before you. I think it does include the three uh, public hearings. Uh, that we've talked about during this meeting. Uh, does anyone else see any additions or corrections to our regular meeting agenda for November 16th? Okay, hearing none, I would entertain a motion to approve the regular meeting agenda and to schedule the required public hearings as uh, presented. So moved. Second. Okay, we have a motion by Commissioner Honeycutt, a second by Commissioner Hsu uh, to approve the regular meeting agenda. Are there any questions or is there a discussion? Okay, hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. Uh, All opposed, no. That passes. Uh, we are in need of a closed session uh, this evening. So at this time, I would entertain a motion to go into closed session to discuss pending litigation and economic <laughs> development authorized by North Carolina General Statute 143 dash 318.11 a three and four okay i hear a motion by commissioner kiger a second by commissioner Hsu, or vice versa but i think that's the way i heard it um yeah i got a thumbs up on that one thank you um is there any discussion on the motion Okay, hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. Uh, that motion passes, and we are now in closed session. I want to thank our television audience for joining us tonight. Uh, we encourage everybody to remember tomorrow's election day. Uh, please go out and vote if you haven't already. And we look forward to seeing all of you back at our regular meeting uh, on November 16th. That is correct, November 16th at 6.30 p.m. Thank you for joining us tonight. <laughs>